Sadashiva Samarambam Shankara Sharya Madhyamam Asmada Sharya Pariyantam Vande Guru Param Param Okay, so we we stopped last week on space and consciousness. We did see the beginning of that of that title, the paragraph, when uh, it's difficult to resolve the space. I mean, the, the other four elements, as we have seen, uh, the idea is the other four elements, they are easily resolved back into space. Uh, and that was the argument uh, presented by an inquir inquirer. Uh, but uh, the space, how can we resolve in space? And uh, because uh, space is, you know, it's, it's unsubstantial, let's say, you know, insubstantial, or, or it's like uh, the, the ultimate aspect of, of matter or, 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 or creation. When we look into creation, what is the fundamental nature of creation? The most essence, essential and most elemental, it's in space. So then we cannot resolve things into space. We can resolve things into space, but beyond space. And then the author here says that the difficulty in understanding, you know, this level of inquiry is due to space similarity to consciousness. You know? We looked a little bit into the nature of space last week. Vedanta is about learning to recognize and dismiss ignorance. So we want to dismiss ignorance. We not necessarily want to understand uh, metaphysically or, or, or even scientifically what space is. So we have those hints coming from, from, from the ancient text about the basic elements in which space is the, the most subtle. And, uh, and we know that everything comes from consciousness by the power of Maya. Maya bring, brings about the three energies and the three energies, you know, they, they manufacture, they construct the, the basic primary elements. But Vedanta is not about the elements, it's about recognizing uh, and dismissing ignorance. We cannot dismiss ignorance unless we recognize ignorance. So. If we believe that, uh, no, I don't have any ignorance operating and uh, I, 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 know, I know what I am, I know who I am. And then of course we do not need Vedanta. Yeah? So we, we have cleared that confusion already. But uh, otherwise uh, Vedanta is about first recognizing and then once we recognize that there is some some ignorance operating that is somehow is conditioning my human experience in a negative manner. And then I need to address and I need to, to remove, dismiss or neutralize or, or destroy that ignorance. And we know that the only, the only remedy against ignorance is knowledge. And the knowledge we are talking about is self-knowledge because when we talk in terms of ignorance, we are referring to self-ignorance, the ignorance in respect to my, my true identity in nature. Yeah? The objector here in this verse is just like the materialist part of the mind of each one of us, yeah? which is too much identified, tied to the sense, and identified with whatsoever the sense organs and the mind see yeah? as reality. So, and of course, we cannot really uh, sense the space due to its uh, subtlety and similarity with consciousness, much less consciousness. Consciousness is not an object of, uh, of the sense organs. It's not an object of, uh, of knowledge through the mind and the intellect either. Huh? So it's, uh, the mind needs to be very subtle yeah, as opposed to a very dense and materialist but uh, in order to go into those subtle levels of uh, inquiry, this, the essence of this teaching is about getting the mind to shift from the experience-based view of reality to a knowledge-based view. I, I love this 
this sentence. I love this passage. Okay, we want to 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 cancel, you know, those the, the driven uh, that vasana, that tendency, that drive towards the sense organs wanting to experience reality. We need to 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 let go of that tendency by developing a different vasana, a, a, deeper, a different tendency. Now I have converted my vasana for experience into a vasana for understanding, knowledge, okay? Which is a, all together of a different nature. So we want to shift from experience-based lifestyle or view of reality in the case of the seeker of truth to a knowledge-based view. And then what is most amazing about this sentence, now I, Lynn is already having a good laugh today, oddly enough by analyzing experience. So that's the beauty of, of Vedanta. Vedanta is not a philosophy because it's all about of, uh, analysis of our very ordinary day-to-day -day experience of life. It's a matter of experience. Again, so now here we go into, into analyze our experience. It's gonna be a little bit more subtle than other teachings because we, 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 are, we are analyzing uh, 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 our experience of, uh, of existence, you know? We are, it's inquiring to the nature of existence, you know, which is similar to, to the inquiring to the nature of consciousness, you know? And we know that uh, we, we can't really experience existence consciousness and at the same time we do experience consciousness existence, huh? because the very fact that Mark comes to eyes and says like, okay, no, I know I exist. So how, how come you know that you exist? Oh, because I'm existing right now. And then experience your existence. And then Mark would say, no, I can't really experience it that way, you know, because I am existence. Yeah? So if I am existence, there is no need for validation. There is no need for, you know, anything that I can experience. Uh, through my, my sense, you know, my five sense and the mind, because it is what I am. I am existence, I am consciousness. Therefore, anytime and every time a yogi asks us to say that, so in which way you experience your existence, your consciousness, they say, no, I am existence, consciousness. Therefore, I do not need to experience. And if I, anything that you experience, you fool, it's going to be a phenomenal, an, an experience, a phenomenal object, and every time it's gonna be different because the mind experiences this, this phenomenon. It's in a constant flux of change. Huh? It is a matter of experience that existence is not dependent on, of, of objects. We say that an object, a tree, for example, exists, is. That the tree exists is not a belief, not an opinion. Uh, then we say that another object, like a stone, for instance, exists, is. And we see that all objects exist. The isness, the existence, the isness of everything, of the tree and the stones and everything, you know, is the same. That's the bottom line belong to the tree. If the isness of the tree belongs to the tree, it would not transfer to the stone, right? So the tree exists, and they are saying, yeah, but okay, but it is a, a tree existence, which is different from stone existence. And then we have to say, okay, and then we need to find a different name for the existence of stone. No, we use the same name because existence is one and the same. So the, the, the existence of one thing does not need to modify, to occupy another object to produce a different sort of existence. No, it's existence, it's the isness, that what is. Huh? And that existence is not a belief, nor our opinion. So, yeah, so it's nice to, to look into this. The, uh, <clears throat> The tree exists is not a belief and opinion. So the existence of the object is not subject to, to, to philosophical discussions because we know that every object exists, right? It's very simple. 
Yeah? And we know that uh, Claudio exists as well. He has no doubt about that. Uh, no, I exist. How do you know? Because I am existence. Huh? I am existing. And if I cannot experience myself objectively, you know, divide myself in two, I can experience myself. Why? Because it's my very nature. How am I not experiencing my very nature? How can the fire not experience its own heat? It's, it's fires on nature. You understand? And it will never experience its own nature outside of itself, but experience as what? As its own nature. So self-knowledge is the most simple thing because we experience our own fundamental nature all the time, our existence, which is the same name of consciousness, synonymous of consciousness. It is a matter of experience that, that existence is independent, yeah. So <clears throat> we see all objects. If the isness of a tree belongs to a tree, it could not be transferred to another object. Each, each object would have a different kind of isness of, uh, of existence. But this is not what we ex experience. We experience everything existing, equally existing, and there is no degree of existence. No? It can be a, a virus and it can be a, a brilliant, beautiful human being. Both existence are the same, okay? God's given existence to all objects, the sentient and the inert object. <clears throat> if it had a different kind of existence, it, it would have a different name because we have names for everything we experience. Therefore, we have name for everything in the experience is very significant. Huh? We have names for everything we experience. If every if, if existence would be a byproduct of a name and form of a configuration of the elements, and then of course we would give it a different name. But no, it's one single existence. It's not like every configuration has different properties. And since the properties are different, they are described differently by different names. You know, this object has these properties, and those are the names in regards to the property, which is different from the names given to the properties of something else. Huh? The object is. Therefore, the isness is generic, and it's not. Is specific to an object. It's not a byproduct of any object. The object is appreciated by the sense, and the isness is appreciated by the intellect. Now, how about that? How about that? Very nice, huh? So the mind and the sense are going to experience, you know, and appreciate you know, the, the 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 object, the mind and the sense will be appreciate the name and form, the name, color and form of the object. But in order for us to appreciate the existence of the stone, we need more than the, the sense organs and the mind, okay? We need a, 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 a refined intellect that can see, you know, I am experiencing the existence and literally, we experience the existence of every object. So that's why we say again and again, Vedanta is very practical because it's analysis of experience. So the, the existence of the stone is appreciated by the intellect. If we did not experience existence, we would not say that anything exists. So this is also very relevant. If we would not experience existence ourselves, means to say, if we would not, if we would be non-existent, we would not be able to say that the stone exists and the tree exists. We wouldn't be able to establish the existence of anything. Huh? So existence must be my very nature, which is common to the nature of every object which exists. 
the isness of every object is consciousness. All right, now, now we flip the other side of the coin from existence to consciousness. The isness of every object is consciousness. It cannot be argued that I am not conscious. I, I cannot be conscious unless I exist. So we have looked into that. Now, I need to exist to be conscious, and I need to be conscious to know that I exist, to establish my existence. So existence and consciousness are just the same thing. Huh? So that's why the scriptures beautifully, and the revealed knowledge beautifully uh, <coughs> express the nature, our true nature as satchit, huh? satchit, existence and consciousness, because it's the same thing. It manifests itself. You know, once the jivas come into play, it manifests as what? as existence, like all other configurations of Maya, and it also manifests as what? As knowledge, which is another name for consciousness, knowingness, yeah? the, the, the chitta, the, the power to know, to, yeah? to determine. I cannot separate my existence and my consciousness. Therefore, all objects are me. So if I know that I exist and my existence is the same existence because the nature of existence is one without a second, is no dual. If I understand that existence is another aspect or another nature of Brahman, meaning to say, it is consciousness as well. It's knowledge, it's the knowledge that exists in potential, you know, and manifests the universe as, as the existence, the isness of everything and the consciousness or the knowledge that comes about, not only to Ishwara to create, sustain, and destroy, but to the jivas to appreciate, enjoy, and experience the existence. Uh, in a conscious, through its conscious, its human conscious mind, so that we can process our karma and grow. But if therefore all objects are existence, I am existence, the objects are existence, therefore all objects are me. But how so? I have a, a, a a conscious mind and uh, inert objects do not have conscious mind. But it's just a small detail you know, because uh, the fact that my configuration, this, 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 uh, this name, this form, this body, this object, you know, shining with consciousness is only due to the fact that I have, I have a subtle body, you know, and the other objects. That's why not long ago, I began calling the inert objects as creatures as well. They are inert creatures. We are sentient creatures. They are insentient creatures, but they are creatures. Why? Because they were created. God, God creation, he create all objects of the universe, right? So if everything exists and the existence of the object is the same as my existence, so everything is me. All objects are me. Vedanta is learning to appreciate the isness. The isness. And then uh, it looks like it looks like James, he said, the meanness of everything. So that's when uh, we begin referring to consciousness not as something other than myself, but we begin refer to it as yes, me. Yes, my true nature. Yes, the nature of everything, you know. So uh, it's learning to, to recognize, you know, claim, and therefore appreciate the, the isness, the existence, and the, the meanness of everything. So I appreciate why, because it's all me, you know, it's all this beautiful play you know, in which there is only one existence, one consciousness manifesting as the cosmos. 
by separating and Vedanta suggests a certain sadhana, which is based on the separation of the object from the existence that supports it. This is a beautiful sentence. Now we're gonna see the object and we're gonna see the objects, but then with the, the Vedantic vision, we see not only the object, we see beyond the object, right? and then ultimately we see what the existence behind every object sustaining everything, which is another way to say, we see the consciousness that is there behind my Ishwara sustaining everything, you know, the consciousness, which is existence. The existence that supports it. For example, sunlight falls on a tree. I see both the tree and the sunlight, but we, when asked what I see, I say, I see a tree. It's true that I see a tree, but it's only partially true because I also see something else because I'm omitting the most essential part of my experience from my understanding, which is the sunlight. Very nicely put. I am omitting the most fundamental, essential aspect of myself, which is consciousness, existence. We are just illumining our environment. We are shedding our light of consciousness and then experiencing knowing our environment and we begin looking for consciousness because we see what we learn, what we reveal, but we don't recognize the most essential part of my own experience, which is my existence, the light of my conscious existence, right? So far, so good. So, I mean, you, you guys at this point, I mean, you probably, you, you, you have no doubt about who you are and what you are. Huh? And uh, there's no question, I mean, it's so clear, this text is so beautifully organized and clear, you know, and, and proves to us by the means of logic, right? examining our experience that we cannot omit anymore. We cannot neglect our conscious existence light and providing us with the intellect and the five senses by which we, we experience and know our environment. So it's always there, not never not present, eh? as our, one of our friends used to say. Similarly, when I look at myself, I say, I am so and so from such and such a place, born at a certain time. I ignore the most important part, my existence consciousness. So we are introducing ourselves, we introduce our life history, our place and time and, uh, and qualifications and, and we ignore the most important thing, which is, which is understandable because even if you know what is most important about uh, yourself, you know, and the people who know that they don't need to say, because, uh, you know, how can you introduce yourself in that manner? I, I turn to Lynn and I say, hi, ah, Lynn, nice to meet you, Mr. Consciousness here. And then she says the same thing, I'm ah, Mrs. Consciousness here. So how can you introduce consciousness to consciousness if consciousness is no dual? So we better shut up and we just introduce ourselves as how uh, the attributes of the body, body mind. My existence is the existence that pervades everything. This existence is not localized. Inquiry is learning to appreciate myself as formless existence, non-dual conscious existence. It only becomes localized when I associate it with a particular name and form. Every wave is only water. Yeah? All, every wave is only ocean. Verse 40, what remains after the sheets have been negated is an unmoving and ungraspable, unnamed, unnameable, unmanifest, apparently indefinite, all-pervading, space-like something 
beyond light and darkness. So this is a very nice description of our nature. Yeah? Once we have done this work of uh, undoing the confusion between consciousness and, and all experience that occur you know, through consciousness and the mind and the, and the sense right, and the intellect. So once we, we, we stop, we, cor we correct this, this superimposition, this confusion, you know, between consciousness, my true nature, and my experience through the mind and the intellect and the sense organs, because we tend to define ourselves through what? Through our experience. Have you noticed that? When we experience, when we introduce ourselves, we am so and so, and the descriptions we present is just my experience. Now, once we stop this confusion, I've confused myself with my experience. In other words, once we do this discrimination between the three bodies and the five sheets, which is nothing but different levels of human experiences, uh, once we negate all of that, once we undo that confusion, uh, what remains is what? Is unmoving, uh, actionless, ungraspable because it's not an object of knowledge. It is unnamed because it's beyond name and forms. We give names to people, to things that have attributes and qualities, you understand? It has a shape, a color. Consciousness is nameless, shapeless, colorless, and attributeless. Huh? How about that? So it's the most subtle, the subtle free of qualities. So therefore it has no name. It has no name, although the scriptures try to give a hint that it's of the nature of Satchitananda. And there is no way we can find a name, it's unnameable. Although we may call it Paramatma or Brahman, it is unmanifest, yet it appears to manifest as Jagata. No? But we cannot really easily grasp Brahman in Jagata unless we can see through Jagata, yeah, having the vision of of the Upanishad, the Upanishadic vision, and then we can, we can see it. Can you just give me a moment, please? Uh -huh. So what remains is what? It's my true nature, huh? without name, without moving, without doing anything, unmanifest yet manifest, it's something that cannot be defined, but yet, you know, is, is knowable, but knowable not in the objective sense. It can be known, yes, it can be known, but cannot be known as well. And there are a lot of discussions about that. It, it's it's a knowable thing, or it's unknowable. Okay, you some some place they are going to say, no, it's beyond, it's unknowable, it's impossible to know. No? But no, it is knowable. It's because people do not uh, value knowledge in the in the right sense. You know, they believe that knowledge is a problem, intellect is a problem. No. Self-knowledge, of course, in the intellect, it does not, of course, in our ears or eyes or any one of our sense organs, you understand? The sense organs have the purpose to provide us with data, with experience, with information. But knowledge uh, happens in the intellect and self-knowledge is not an exception as well. It is uh, what it's all pervading is one of the best definitions of the self is it's uh, all pervasiveness, you know, it pervades everything as the substratum of this projection of this superimposition, it is space like it's not something because it's not of this media world in world in media we find things objects. It is a space like as 
you know, as something, but it's not, and it's it's beyond space because space shares its existence with consciousness. It it obtains its existence with consciousness, but as we know, space is not conscious and much less self-conscious. It does not even shine with consciousness. So, but we say there are some features in space which are kind of similar to consciousness. And it's beyond light and darkness. So it's beyond, it's before or beyond light, which is a symbol of knowledge and darkness, which is a symbol of ignorance. So this is also something very intriguing. So how can consciousness be beyond knowledge and ignorance? Huh? We, we get an idea that, oh, no, no, consciousness is knowledge. No, consciousness is that in which knowledge occurs and ignorance occurs. So knowledge and ignorance, they are byproduct of the play of the three gunas. Uh, reflecting in the human intellect, or the three gunas, meaning to say, pure sattva, shining as Ishwara, which is the intelligent cause of the cosmos, right? So, but uh, consciousness is beyond even Ishwara. So, uh, consciousness does not really directly provide Ishwara with knowledge. So, Maya brings about the first modification in consciousness which is the fundamental prakriti. And out of that né, fundamental nature of the universe, né, and then we have sattva, and more sattva is there in the human intellect, the more knowledge, the more ability to, to understand and know will be available to us. So we have knowledge and we have ignorance, and uh, there is something in all of us that know what we know and know what we do not know. I know my ignorance, so I, I am ignorant of so many things. Huh? So how can I say that? Huh? Because I am something other than knowledge, other than ignorance. That's why the Yanis in general, they are no longer craving for knowledge as a means to complete itself because it knows, he, she knows that consciousness is altogether from another order, okay, which does not depend on knowledge to complete itself. More knowledge, more knowledge, more knowledge, more knowledge, no. And furthermore, trying to complete oneself by the means of accumulation of knowledge, it is a, it is a, a helpless uh, accomplishment or, or impossible mission because the more we know, the more we are aware of what we know, and the more ignorance pops up. No, oh, no, now I'm knowing more. And then, oh my God, before I knew almost nothing and uh, I was not aware of my ignorance. So we are definitely something beyond light and darkness, meaning to say knowledge and ignorance. Then what is this fuss about self-knowledge that no, you need to get this knowledge, you have to get knowledge, you need to have more sativa and get more knowledge because of the words, you are not going to be enlightened and uh, you're not going to be free. Huh? But then we are referring to a, a different kind of knowledge. It's knowledge of one's essential nature. Huh? So for that knowledge, we don't need a, a, the accumulation of scientific, philosophical, or whatsoever kind of objective knowledge. How many people have realized their true nature have self-knowledge. There are countless stories about sages that have a, a, a little or no education. And recently we had Nitsagadatta Maharaj that had almost no formal education and yet recognized you know, its true nature. Huh? So because uh, it does not matter what I know, it does not matter what I do not know, you know, the, the yani is, is relaxed about that. It, it does not matter what I have experienced and what I have not experienced. I have no craving for experience. I have no craving for objective knowledge. 
because I got the knowledge that resolved this fundamental human problem, which is the knowledge of my true nature. Right? <clears throat> why? Why to resolve the problem? Because then I, I, I realized that this is the only knowledge that provides me with my inert, my inherent completion. You understand? Puna, I'm, I'm okay. Completion means there's nothing missing, there's nothing lacking. All is good and nothing can touch me, not even Shiva you know, with, with, uh, with its sword of death. What remains after? So here there is Ramji, uh, <coughs> I criticize a little bit the, the language. We are not going to go much into that because we are, we are advanced students. We know, we understand very well the limitation of language, yeah? but yet we know that the only way to convey these teachings is by the meaning of language. And then the Vedanta teacher he used the language at, at its disposal, he used the language to the best of its ability, uh, 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 knowledge, identity, language, to the best of one's ability, okay? avoiding to the best of one's ability, the language of experience and time, you understand? becoming and transcending all those things. We try to do that, but whenever we, we can't, otherwise the teaching remains too dry as well. So we, we use language, those, those experiential <clears throat> time, space, uh, you know, language, uh, and we, we do so uh, correcting right away. We do, but they say it's not really like that. It's just, it's just due to the limitation of language. I have no problem with these words. I, I have been using them most of the time, including all pervading. So pervaded, pervadedness is, is a very, very nice feature of consciousness because uh, it's, it's, it's the substratum of everything, substratum of Mitya. No? Beyond, beyond light and darkness mean beyond uh, knowledge and ignorance and also means beyond duality. Knowledge and ignorance, it says. Beyond is a special metaphor. You know, it's, it has its problem as every word. I, I, I don't use it very often, but sometimes I do it. We can see it as before or beyond, yeah? but knowing that consciousness is not before or beyond because it's non-dual and there is only consciousness and it pervades everything, even before the manifestation and after the manifestation to go back to its seed potential condition. Yeah? And then here it's, it concludes say, uh, there is a, a good way to say is what I am is not beyond, it's not beyond, it's not transcendental, what I am and in, in reference to the objects that in the world with matter, with nature, you know, when, when you observe the world. So I am saying you know, other than rather than beyond or, or, or any other metaphor in that sense or before. I am other than, but here it's still a dualistic language because if we say other than, we are still talking in terms of duality, but Vedanta teaches in duality. So what is the most fundamental duality in Vedanta? It's such in Mitya. So if the nature of consciousness is non-dual, and if reality is consciousness, meaning to say the nature of reality is non-dual, and then how can we bring Mitya into the equation? And then not only, and then we have to dig into Mitya to try to understand Mitya because the jiva is another wave appearing in Mitya. Huh? So jiva itself is a, an appearing phenomenon. And then there is no way around. We need to go into Mitya. We need to bring Mitya into the equation and to explain our very human experience. I exist and I experience the material world around me. So how about that? How can you say that the nature of reality is non-duality? 
and that this, this universe is not really real. So we cannot just make those statements, oh, there is this question. On those days, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, I was crazy with this statement. And I was dwelling on them all the time. All oh, there is is consciousness and I am that. All oh, there is is consciousness, it's non-dual consciousness and I am that. So it, uh, it does not help much unless we understand the not self because we identified with the not self. Isn't it, Mark? And then here, I believe Ramji comes with another statement that says, even to say pure existence is not correct. Yeah. To say pure limitless consciousness, pure limitless existence, it, uh, it has an implied meaning that it becomes impure once Maya brings about Mitya. Yeah? It's oh, it was pure before. Yeah? And then it was an impure when Maya superimposed names and form. So we say those things. Why we say pure consciousness? Is to make a distinction between pure consciousness and human consciousness, because human consciousness are going to be conditioned by the attributes of the reflecting medium, meaning to say by the gunas. Yeah? So what is pure consciousness? Is consciousness before it shines in the reflecting medium, yeah? referred as the subtle body. And then we have the pure light, and then we have reflect light, original consciousness, reflect consciousness. So all of these are tools. And I did not understand why Ranji went so much into disconstructing all these important tools. We say pure existence is not correct because it implies that there is an impure, existence whenever Maya is manifest or is it, or exists maybe non-existence. So <clears throat> the objector continues to say only four of the five elements are subject to change. The space is eternal, therefore is not subject to birth and death. So this is interesting as well when we are when I observe that the other four elements, they are subject to change. Yeah? So we have air, fire, water, and earth, and everything is in a flux of change. In the air, we may find pollution, we find a lot of chemical elements yeah? uh, mixing up with the, the pure uh, air, let's say. So, and so the fire and, and the other elements, but space seems to be very pure. Yeah? Pure, why, why it's pure? Because it's changeless, another feature of space. Huh? It, uh, it, it does not really change. It does not develop anything other than itself. It's not like the other that can, you know, having different attributes or characteristics or qualities or properties, it keeps, it keeps already, we see that, uh, that, that order of, uh, of constant change. Now, constant change. Now, space remains unchanged. Uh, only the four change. Space is eternal. It's not subject to change, and it's not subject to birth and death. So that I'm not really sure, huh? because as we know, uh, space is not the final real deal. Huh? Space is a byproduct of Maya. Therefore, in space, in space apparently goes out of existence every time that the universe yeah, reverts back to its uh, potential seed condition, formation. Huh? Out of space, the four elements are present in the form of elementary particles, which combine to make the manifests universe, the gross elements. So out of space, we have the four other elements, yeah, which are going to grossify to become the physical elements. So the point here is that he says that it's, it's beyond birth and death. 
So we're gonna see what Swami Paramatananda says here or James says here. As we know, uh, out of space, we have the unfoldment of the the other the other element. Space comes out of space, and then it shares what? It shares space nature and air nature. Yeah? Air comes out of space, and then, and then fire, and then what? Each each level of classification is carrying with itself the other the features of the previous element. And space is the only one that remains pure in that sense. Yeah? Because when we look into air, air is no longer pure because air is a byproduct of space and he has to give a room for space and then air. Yeah? And then the other elements, the same thing, it makes room for the other two. And then I have my own element as fire and then water and earth. So space is the only one that remains really pure in that sense. Materialists can understand the destruction of objects in space, but not the destruction of space itself. For them, space is the ground of being. So it's the real thing, it's the ultimate. Yeah? So they, they analyze matter. You know? So they look into the subatomic structure of the atom and then he find, they find photons and other aspects of, of light and space there. And they believe that space is, uh, is the ultimate deal, you know, the ground of being as described here. This belief is based on the idea that space is real. Well, it's more, more to the point is to say that this misunderstanding or this belief is based on an idea that the space is the source of the universe. Mm. So if you believe that, that the, the end, you know, the, the very beginning of everything, the, the source yeah, is space, yeah, it's the ground of being, is, is where we're going to find the God particle is in space. So space is the ultimate yeah, subtle thing that originates the universe. So that misunderstands is what, as far as the, the scientific mind can go, observing the nature of matter of the universe, they go up to space and they find space to be the ground of being. So, but the space is not something self-contained. To be the ground of being, to be the source, it needs to be what? Self-contained. Huh? It has to be self dominant self-existing. It has to exist on its own and then concede existence to the other elements and to the entire universe. But we from Vedanta, we know that space is not self-contained because it depends on something else and for its existence. Huh? It's only a belief because materialists cannot prove the existence of space as an experienceable object. Again, the materialists, they only believe in what can be captured by the five sense. Since space is too subtle and cannot really be captured by the five sense, and then they take space to be the ground of being, the source, the ultimate. Huh? So we cannot see space with our eyes. We can infer the existence of space with the intellect, but there is no direct perception of this space. It is irreduc irreducible substrate for them because they ignore the existence aspect of space. In other words, they cannot see beyond space. So they, they infer that there is, a, there is space the space is, is an object. It can be known through the intellect as a notion, a concept of space. You can experience only the notion, the concept of space. It's a, it's a conceptualized object, but it cannot be experienced through the sense organs. So therefore, they, they, they don't believe it. They don't believe that this is something 
you know, that, uh, that is part of this universe, it's part of creation, it must be the, the source, the origin of creation, why? Because it has no properties and does not change and does not do anything and it's never affected by anything. They say, no, this is not a phenomenal object and then it must be the ground of the universe, the source of the universe, big mistake. It's only because they never took the light of consciousness of the very people doing the research and the investigation, not satya. They cannot prove the existence of space because they can never objectify space. We cannot see space with our eyes. We can infer it with the intellect, but there is no direct perception of space. Space is irreductible. Irreductible, irreducible substrate for them because they ignore what? They ignore what is behind the space, you know which is the most subtle. Yeah? Space is a byproduct of Maya. And behind Maya, there is the most subtle of the subtle. Even Maya, they cannot conceptualize. Even the people in the spiritual world, they, they they, they cannot understand art. They say, oh, these guys, they brought Maya into the picture. They are the Maya fathers. You know? they, they got into this, this notion that there is such a thing as Maya. Yeah? It's, uh, it's, it's an object as well. It's a, a notion. Yeah? It's, again, a conceptual object. And we did that with the help of the scriptures and we back it up by, by logic as well, analyze it because nothing can come from nothing. Since consciousness by our own experience cannot do anything, you understand? Because it is actionless. Something must be there to, to bring into motion this apparent reality. And that is a power. And this power was revealed to us as Maya. You know? So they cannot understand anything beyond space. Vedanta simply point, points out that you cannot ignore the existence consciousness aspect of space. So how can ex space exist? How do space exist? Exists, yeah, by inference, I know it exists as the container in which the universe appears. Huh? So the universe cannot appear if there is no space. It accommodates all the objects of the universe. So we know that there is space. We cannot ignore the existence, conscious aspect of space. It consciousness, not space, is the ground of being, as we know, because you cannot have space without the conscious existence, yeah? existence consciousness, yeah? which is the, the ground of being. Space depends on consciousness. So another aspect of space is the space not being self-contained. It, uh, it depends, it, it enjoys a dependent existence, nature, because it, it lands, no? it, it borrows existence from consciousness. No? Space is, enjoys a dependable existence, but it does not depend on the space. Space dep depends on consciousness, but consciousness does not depend on space. Space is mitya, is below the line of Maya. Materialists do not accept the idea that the world is not real. Okay, again, now we go into this real, not real. Yeah, it's, uh, it's better to take it that the world is not, that the world is only apparent real. Yeah? Because there are a lot of things that exist, as we know, being a mirage in the desert, the most traditional example. We see a mirage, we know the mirage exists. Huh? It exists, but it's not really real. The rainbow exists, but it's not really real. When you go there on the circumstance change a little bit, it's just a phenomenon. Huh? So there are things that exist, but there's a mere appearance in the, in the consciousness. Huh? 
<clears throat> but the materialists believe that the world is real. Huh? And they, be they believe that it comes out of space. And that is because they believe that reality is that which can be captured by the sense organs. So what is the definition of reality? The reality is that which can be perceived. And when you look into different uh, philosophers and, and circles discussing the nature of uh, our reality, what is reality, what is real, huh? you, you can observe that they're all uh, talking about the, the equipment by which né, the human consciousness apprehends the universe and defines or decides or determines what is real. So no, that is not the reality. Reality is not, uh, no matter how sharp one's intellect may be to assert what is the real nature of reality, what is real, if the reality, if the nature of reality is, is being laid upon the objects we are looking to the term reality, we missed out because reality is the light of consciousness of the very, no? the very investigator, the very philosopher. They are, they are talking about reality, but they are trying to find reality in media through the sense of it in a very fine philosophical intellect, but they are going to miss because they are missing out on the most fundamental aspect of their experience, which is the light of consciousness. So when we come to Vedanta, we, we get introduced to the definition of reality. Reality is that which is always ever present. There is nothing phenomenal in Nietzsche that is always ever present. Huh? So what is reality for us? Is that which is always ever present never change from one moment to another, never change from one year to another, never range from one <coughs> millennium to another. Understand? It's always ever present and never changing. Never change and never moving. Always remain the same and always present. Materialists, materialists do not accept the idea that the world is not real because they believe in the, the sense organs and the experience. Experience exists, but it's not real because existence exists without experience. How beautiful, huh? The experience exists. The world exists. But there is something that exists, you know, sustaining, sustaining the world of experience. And that is the only reality, which is the conscious existence that we experience in our very intellect, you know. So we are not dependable, dependable on experience. The materialists and also the spiritual people who are oriented towards experience, enlightenment as an experience, a state, yeah? they become dependent on experience. And the Upanishad says that experience is there, it's, it's, it exists, yeah? it is experienced by everybody. Life is nothing but experience. In fact, in fact experience is some, some of our teachings is, is pointed out to be the relational aspect of consciousness once it is in contact with objects. Once we are in contact with objects, and then consciousness appears as the object, and then we have experience, which is the relational feature of consciousness. So experience is the very, very law of this manifest apparent reality. So it is there, and it is through experience that we can evolve, we can grow, we can purify, you know, and so on. So but experience is not really real because the only reality is the conscious existence of the experiencer. Huh? But we need experience to develop yeah, a certain intellect that can understand the fundamental nature. The only knowledge 
that's going to give us peace. Huh? And uh, this consciousness is free and independent from experience, okay? So experience is this, but not real. It, because existence exists without experience. So our nature is free and independent of experience. And this is a, a, a difficult one because uh, we, as, as human beings, we tend to develop a huge vasana for experience because it's through experience, as I was saying, we grow yeah, if we are smart. Yeah? But then we, we develop a certain uh, tendency or, or addiction and we want to experience. If we don't experience too much, we feel like, oh my God, I'm getting older. and. Uh, you know, I'm missing out here. I need to experience more. It's like my father. I'm going to see my father this weekend, 92 years, and he's feeling very, very sad because now he cannot squeeze experience anymore because the body mind is, you know, and he's very miserable, of course, because he did not develop the wisdom that allows the individual, you know, to say, ha ha, now experience are not very available because my instrument of experience, my body-mind complex is worn out, but thanks God, I don't need experience anymore. I'm free and independent of experience. So existence exists with or without experience. Existence is not against experience, but existence consciousness, our true nature does not crave for experience because we know that we have learned what we were meant to learn from experience and now I want to rest in my true nature as consciousness always purna huh? in the presence or in the absence of experience. I knew that this subject would be so wonderful that I would feel like not stopping <clears throat> but we are over the time here. And we better meet again soon. And uh, Lynn, you, you mentioned that this Thursday you cannot come on, uh, on Wednesday. So I, if, if Karen was here, I was going to ask her if she would be okay to, okay to move it for Friday to accommodate you, but I don't know, she's not here. I will catch up on YouTube. Okay, all right. Om Purnamada Purnamida Purna Purnamuda Chate Purna Tia Purnamadaya Purname Babashi Chate Om Chanti 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 Thank you a lot. Thank you, my good friends. We meet again next Monday. Ishwara Wheeling, River Dirty. Ciao.